All right. Wanted to start the podcast with something I've been thinking about a lot last few days. James Harden is unhappy. He's an unhappy superstar. We've seen this happen in the NBA a bunch of times. This one feels a little different because he's unhappy with the situation that he single-handedly created. He single-handedly cultivated. It seems like he made most of the calls. It didn't work out. He came close to a title in 2019 and really close in 2018. Fell short. I would point a lot of the blame at him and his playoff performances. I would say the roster composition was probably a little less to blame, but still he came short and now he wants to jump elsewhere and he might go to Brooklyn. He might go to Philly. He's also handled it really, 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 really terribly. Uh, Goes to Vegas right as everybody's convening to start the preseason. Just seems like he doesn't want to be there anymore. And he's going to try to force their hand. And you watch this from afar and you think, well, why would Houston let him do this? Why wouldn't they just say, you know what? Fuck you, dude. We're not trading you. You're the franchise superstar. We've done everything we possibly could to bring a contender for you. And you're going to stay. We're not trading you. Of course, we know they're not going to do that. We know he's going to get traded. It got me thinking about all the different eras we've had with unhappy superstars, when it started, how it's evolved, and where it's going. Because I think the last four years, something shifted. And I've talked to a bunch of people in my life. Some people work for teams. Other people just love the league. All of whom are a little bit concerned where this is heading. What is this? What does this mean long term for a league where anybody who's unhappy for a month can just basically force their way out of a franchise? And should we even care? And we've talked about player empowerment, and uh, you know that the seesaw has shifted in a good way in a lot of ways toward the players, where for years and years they're treated basically like property with the owners. Um, they had to fight for every advancement they ever had to make, and at some point the balance has shifted which is really dangerous because this is a league that relies on loyalty of fan bases. It relies on generations of fans supporting basically laundry, rooting for uniforms and rooting for the legacy of a team. And if you're threatening that and it just turns into a league of hired guns and fans just rooting for players over teams and um, fans feeling like there's no loyalty to them and everything that they do when they support somebody like James Harden. If you're in Houston, you're defending him the last seven years as fans from other teams are like, that guy chokes in the playoffs. You can't win with that guy. He's too selfish. If you're a Houston fan, you're like, no, no, he's our guy. And you're, you're making all your cases. Um, I think a, a, the best possible outcome of this would have been Dallas over the course of the 2000s where Dirk he wins an MVP, he makes a finals, they come damn close. And then at some point, we all basically decide, eh, he doesn't have what it takes. He's he's definitely a great star, but he's not somebody you can win a title with. And the Dallas fans are sitting there going, no, no, this guy's great. This guy's had bad luck. Um, this guy's better than you think he is. And then it all culminates in 2011, they win the title. Dirk outplays LeBron and Wade on the biggest stage possible, leads Dallas to the title. And how much Mavericks fans love Dirk and love that Dallas team and felt a part of it. Um, it wasn't just what happened that year. It was the 12 years that led up to it and Dirk being on the same team. And that's probably the last pure title anyone's ever won. You go, you go through after that, it's, you know, LeBron jumping to Miami. He wins a couple um, I guess the San Antonio one, San Antonio is the last pure title, actually, the more I'm thinking about it, just because it was Duncan Parker, Ginobili, and they built around those dudes. But for the most part, we're not going to see those anymore because with the exception of somebody like Steph Curry, most of these guys are going to jump around. And that's just where we are. The, the piece about guys being unhappy, I think um, you really have to look back at NBA history because this is not a new thing. This is not this is not an epidemic of, oh my God, all these guys are jumping teams. This is crazy. The NBA is never like this. The NBA actually has been like this for a long time, for almost six decades. There's one wrinkle that's different, which we're going to get to, but I wanted to go quickly, give you a little history lesson about the league. So who's the first guy ever who demands a trade who says, get me the fuck out of here. It's Will Chamberlain, the most selfish player of all time. You can read my book. I spent multiple chapters eviscerating the myth that he was better than Bill Russell and that this is a guy that people want to play with. As great as he was, he was a nightmare of a teammate and was somebody that they won the title in 1967. One of the best teams ever to that point, maybe the best team. 
Well, a year later, they lose to Boston. He's mad about it, doesn't like the coach, decides he wants to live in LA and basically tells the team, trade me. And it turns into a staring session and they panic and they trade him and the trade's terrible. It's like Daryl Imhoff and Archie Clark and I can't even remember who else is in it. It's the classic, I don't even know if it was three quarters for a dollar or it was more like three quarters for a $10 bill trade. It was just awful. And then Will goes to the Lakers uh, they make the finals the next two years. They finally win in 1972. And it's just a disaster of a trade. He was the first unhappy guy who said, I'm forcing my way out. The next guy is somebody that nobody really remembers, Earl Monroe on Baltimore. They make the bullet, they make the finals in 1971. He wants more money. The bullets kind of low bomb. They do a staring contest. He demands a trade. And then I think three games into the season, they trade him to the Knicks, which was their big rival and the team they beat in the playoffs. They reunite. Uh, they don't reunite. They unite this Frazier Monroe backcourt. Everybody loses their minds. Uh, but Monroe, Earl of Pearl, for, forced his way out. 1975, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. This is the one I think people go to a lot as a famous example. The first two famous examples are Wilton Kareem. Kareem, 1975, free agency is coming in a year. He's in Milwaukee. He doesn't want to live there anymore. It's too small for him. He wants to go to a big city. He wants to go to New York. The Knicks, of course, fuck it up because they're the Knicks. And he ends up getting traded to the Lakers in a four quarters for a $20 bill trade. They got a lot of young guys. Um, it looked awesome on paper in 1975 if you're the Bucks, but they gave up um, one of the three best players of all time. The next year, the ABA-NBA merger happens. Julius Irving is on the Nets. He has just won the finals with them. He's the best player in the ABA and he's the reason the merger is happening. He wants more money. He decides he wants $3 million for six years. And the Nets are like, cool, we have no money. We did this merger. We got cleaned out. The Nets decide to sell him to Philly because they can't pay him. So you could say he's technically an unhappy superstar. Anyway, that's our first generation. Now we move into the second era. This is the free agency era. This is when free agency becomes a tool for the players to basically say, I'm unhappy. I'm going to leave unless you trade me. First one's Bill Walton. He actually signs with the Clippers, but there's free agent compensation. They have to trade a whole bunch of stuff. It's a disaster and really paves the way for the Clippers to be awful. But Bill Walton was really unhappy and actually sued the Portland medical staff. So imagine if that happened in 2020. That happens. Three years later, Moses Malone wants to sign a free agent contract with Philly. Houston has right of first refusal. Moses wants out. He's tired of carrying them. They figure out a trade. I think it's Caldwell Jones at a number one pick. And he goes to Philly and wins a title and goes down as one of the best 15 players ever. That was not great. Um, the 80s were pretty quiet for the most part. The most fun thing that happened in 1989 Danny Ferry is the number two pick of the Clippers. Um, he was considered to be like a Bill Bradley, Larry Bird type guy. Translation, he was white. Doesn't want to go to the Clippers. He's the son of a former player who's a GM. He knows what a disaster they are. He's like, I'm not going. You got to trade me. So they trade him to Cleveland. Uh, they trade Ron Harper and a couple other things. They get Ferry and he turns out to be basically a bust. But that was, he pulled the Eli Manning. He created the Eli Manning before Eli Manning. Things are still quiet. We head into 1992. This is an important one. Hakeem Olajuwon. They don't make the playoffs, the 92 Rockets. Hakeem is one of the best players in the league. He's no help. He's played with basically nobody since that one year Ralph Sampson was good in 1986. And Hakeem is like, get me out of here. And I remember I was in Boston that summer or that fall, whatever. I think it was that fall when they were really talking about the Rockets might trade him. And the WWE, the WEI hosts are talking about whether the Celtics should trade Reggie Lewis, Reggie Lewis for Hakeem Olajuwon. I loved Reggie Lewis. He was an awesome player. He was a really good two guard. He was an all star. I'm driving around going, "Are you fucking kidding me? Of course we should trade Reggie Lewis for Hakeem Olajuwon. He's one of the best five players in the league." Houston doesn't get an offer they like, and they keep him. And guess what happens? Hakeem rips off the best um, three years in a row. Not only just of his career, but one of the best three-year stretches any center has ever had. They come close in 93, a really good team. They lose in seven, I think, to Seattle. Then they win the finals in 94 and 95. And it's a good example of like, if your superstar is unhappy, ride it out. So remember that one. The other one was Charles Barkley, who was miserable in Philly, had some stuff going on with the local media. He's like, get me out of there. And Philly stupidly says, okay. They trade him for Jeff Hornacek, Andrew Lang, and Tim Perry. That was dumb. He goes to Phoenix. He wins the MVP. They almost beat MJ in the finals. 
uh, in 93, Danny Manning, who's refusing to sign uh, extension with the Clippers, rightly so, because they're the Clippers, and is like, I'm leaving after the year. They trade him to Atlanta. So that, those are all examples of, of players using their free agency leverage to try to hang it over the team's head. But now we're moving into the third era, which was the too much too soon era. And this is the first time we have players who are not of the stature of Will Chamberlain and Kareem and Doc, all those people. These are young guys who are just like, cool, I have leverage. I'm just going to use it. First one, Chris Weber, Golden State. He's there for a year. He has an opt-out in his contract because they have no idea how to do the salary cap scale at that point. Chris Weber says, hey, um, trade me. Either fire the coach or trade me. And the owner's like, we're not firing Don Nelson. We're trading you. They trade him to Washington for three first round picks and Tom Gugliotta. Um, you you can guess how that one turned out for both teams, but this paves this way for all of these unhappy dudes forcing their way out. Alonzo Mourning in Charlotte gets traded to Miami. Dennis Rodman in San Antonio gets traded to Chicago. 1996, Jason Kidd, his whole thing with, uh, with Jamal Mashburn and Jimmy Jackson, that falls apart. Gets traded to Phoenix. Tim Hardaway, super unhappy near the deadline in 1996 in Golden State. Golden State says, cool. Trades in Miami, creates this instant contender in Miami. 1997, Sean Kemp, furious that Jim McElvey had made more money than him, demands a trade, gets traded to Cleveland for Vin Baker. The only one who demanded a trade and didn't get traded was Scottie Pippen, as covered in The Last Dance during the 97-98 season. He's like, get me out of here. I want out. Um, they come pretty close. They almost trade him in the 97 draft to the Celtics for the third and sixth pick and a future number one, which would have been a catastrophe of a trade for the Celtics. Thank God that didn't happen because uh, the Paul Pierce pick would have eventually been in that trade. But he ends up not getting traded. So hold that thought. So right now we have two guys who demanded a trade didn't actually happen. Hakeem, Scotty Pippen. Next one in this era is Latrell Sprewell. I count him. He choked his coach. He was so unhappy, he actually assaulted his coach. So maybe it wasn't necessarily a trade demand, but I'd like to consider choking your coach is a pretty effective way to get traded. So it, they ends up getting suspended for the whole year and gets traded to the Knicks. And then we have two more here. Stefan Marbury in Minnesota in 1999. He's upset because they changed the salary cap stuff. Kevin Garnett is going to 120 million for 126 million for six years. Marbury, the most he can make is six for 71 or six for 81, something like that. He can't handle it. Demands a trade. He wants to be the guy on his own team. They have to trade him to New Jersey. And then the 99 draft, Steve Francis gets drafted by Vancouver, almost starts crying during the draft. It's, it's a pretty incredible moment. And refuses to report, doesn't want to go to Canada, they end up trading to Houston. So now we're into the fourth era. So that era from like 98 to 2004, it was really hard for stars to say, get me out of here because the contracts were so big and so long. Either you wanted to keep the guy or you didn't want to trade him. 2004, things shift. You have Shaq in LA. He's got a year left on his deal. They end up trading him to Miami because him and Kobe cannot coexist anymore. They pick Kobe. They trade him to Miami. Guess what? Guess who won the trade? The team that got Shaquille O'Neal. That happens. Baron Davis, who really hadn't won anything in New Orleans, but was but for the uh, Hornets, was not happy there. They trade him to Golden State for Speedy Claxton and Dale Davis. Good one. Way to go, Golden State. Uh, Vince Carter hates Toronto so much and is so mad and is so unhappy. He basically tanks the season until they trade him. And it's pretty indefensible. And we I covered it in my book. It was not a good moment for the Vince Carter era. I actually went to a game during that era when he was unhappy and um, it was pretty brutal. He, he, uh, he was unhappy. I'll leave it at that. They end up trading him to New Jersey in the worst three quarters for a dollar trade, probably in the history of the league. They had to take Alonzo Mourning's contract, which I think they either had to amnesty or buy out. I can't remember. That trade was so bad. They actually had to take back a bad contract to give up a guy who immediately went to New Jersey and averaged 27 a game. So nice work there. Tracy McGrady, same thing in Orlando. He's unhappy. They can't win. They trade him to Houston for Francis and Mobley. You're not going to believe it, but the team that got Tracy McGrady won that trade. And then Rasheed Wallace in Portland, they were just like, we got to get this guy out of here. They gave him away to Atlanta. They flipped him to Detroit. So a lot of chaos that year, but the narrative at the time wasn't, oh my God, the players player empowerment, they're ruining the league. It was more like, wow, a lot of unhappy guys. What's going on here? Um, shift to 07, Kobe Bryant, he's looking at the end of his prime and he freaks out and is basically like, I need out, trade me. 
And they have a deal in place to send him to Detroit. And I asked him about this when he came in the Grayland Basketball Hour. It, it, the story was true. Like, it, it looked like it was going to be Detroit. And Dr. Buss came in off the top rope, the guy who owned the Lakers, one of the best owners of all time. I was like, we're not trading Kobe. Cancel. So it was like Rip Hamilton, Picks. I forget who else was in it. They end up keeping Kobe. They make the finals. They get Gasol. Uh, I should say they stole Gasol. I should say the league gave them Gasol. Um, Kobe makes the finals, wins two in a row, and everybody goes, whoa, remember when we almost traded Kobe Bryant? So th that's another example of an unhappy guy where the team wrote it out. So I, I just gave you three examples of ride it out. Scotty Pippen in 97, they end up winning the title. Hakeem Olajuwon, they ride it out. They end up winning two titles. Kobe Bryant, they ride it out. They win two titles. The last one from this era is Jason Kidd, who was past his prime in New Jersey at this point, asked for a trade, they traded him to Dallas. So there you go. All right, fifth era, Sons of the Decision. So in 2011, this is really where it starts feeling like modern times. We have Carmelo in Denver, Chris Paul in New Orleans, and Dwight Howard in Orlando, all of whom are super unhappy and they want trades, but now we're covering this in real time in the way that we're starting to cover sports now. Twitter's in place, uh, the whole rumor system, 24 seven sports cycle, first take, uh, all, all sports radio stations, it's all in place. Carmelo ends up basically bullying his way to New York when he could have just waited four months and signed there because he wanted the extra year of money. So ends up depleting a bunch of their assets so he could go. That was a really, dan even though they still got the best player in the trade, they could have just waited four months, but he fucked them over. Let's be honest. They'd lost Gallinari. They lost Wilson Chandler. They lost Felton. They lost a couple of picks. Chris Paul in New Orleans, I don't blame him for wanting out. The league had to take over the team. The NBA owned New Orleans, but he still wanted out and it turned into a little sweepstakes where the Lakers thought they had him. Clippers jumped in last second. They got him. Uh, Stern's legacy was tarnished. That was a barrel left. And then Dwight Howard, who wanted to get traded from Orlando, backed off last second. The rumor was always that he looked at his Twitter replies and his feelings were hurt and he decided to back off. Decided to recommit and then ended up getting traded anyway in 2012. That was the first sign that weird shit was starting to happen here. Um, 2012, Dwight leaves the Lakers, goes to Houston as a free agent. 2014, LeBron jumps from Miami to Cleveland, really kind of blindsides them, but that's free agency. He's entitled to do that. LaMarcus Aldridge goes from Portland to San Antonio for agent. But the unhappy guy during this stretch is Kevin Love in Minnesota, who's putting up big stats on bad teams and wants out. LeBron goes to Cleveland. The doors open up, and all of a sudden, Kevin Love is traded for the Andrew Wiggins pick, and, and we're off. Um, and then, really, the end of that era is just guys jumping around free agency. To, Durant goes to Golden State. Horford goes to Boston. Dwayne Wade goes to Chicago, et cetera. The sixth era starts four years ago. And this is the era that we're all familiar with. And when you see it all laid out, it's kind of alarming. So you have 2017, Hayward jumps from Utah to Boston as a free agent. But we have four unhappy guys who are like, get me out of here. Chris Paul on the Clippers, they can't pay him. They or the Clippers can pay Chris Paul way more than anybody else in free agency. But Chris Paul says, I want to play in Houston. So the Clippers smartly figure out a deal where they can get some assets back. If they didn't do that, they could have fucked them over. Um, Chris Paul goes to Houston for a giant contract. You know how that played out. Kyrie Irving's in Cleveland. He decides he's unhappy. Still not totally sure what he was unhappy about playing with LeBron James, but he decided he was unhappy. One thing leads to another. The team starts to get worried that if they don't trade him, he's going to get knee surgery and screw them over for basically at least half the season, they decide to trade him to Boston for the poo-poo platter. It's the eighth pick. It's a broken down Isaiah Thomas, Jay Crowder, and some other stuff. Boston gets Kyrie Irving. At the same time, Paul George is in Indiana, and he's decided he's unhappy, even though there's no trail whatsoever of somebody being a contender of Paul George is their best player. Um, I mean, you could say during the two, the year they made the conference finals, well, what about that? I was like, all right, that was... a uh, you know, they had like four or five really good guys. I don't think Paul Port Paul George is not your franchise guy dragging you to the third round. He decides he's unhappy and shockingly gets traded to OKC, which we did not see coming. So he teams up with Westbrook. And then the other one is Jimmy Butler in Chicago, who's unhappy, a recurring theme with Jimmy Butler, forces a trade to Minnesota. So those are four in a year. So we never had that. 2018, LeBron jumps from Cleveland, LA. 
we also have the Kawhi Leonard saga. He's unhappy. He doesn't like San Antonio. He feels betrayed. We, we'll never fully know what happened with this one either. He's the only person who's ever turned on Greg Popovich. They end up trading him to Toronto. At the same time, Jimmy Butler, guess what? He's also unhappy in Minnesota. He gets traded to Philadelphia. So now we have six in the span of two years. Unhappy guys. Now we go to 2019. Anthony Davis signs a mega contract with New Orleans. Two and a half years in, he's unhappy. Time for him to leave. I know I'm a franchise player, but I have to actually carry the franchise? Fuck that. I want to go to the Lakers. So he eventually gets traded in the summer of 2019, even though it almost seemed like it was going to happen in February 2019. That same summer, um, Paul George finds out Kawhi is going to the Clippers and Kawhi wants Paul George to join him. Paul George has just signed a massive long-term extension to stay in OKC. Um, and he's like, cool. Yeah, that would be cool if we end up on the Clippers together. I'm going to ask OKC for a trade. OKC's like, what? We just made this huge commitment to you. What, what about the barbecue that Russ had? So now Paul George is in that trade. He leaves. And then Westbrook finds out Paul George is leaving. He's like, all right, well, get me the fuck out of here. And they trade him to Houston. So we have those three. Plus, we have Butler jumps to Miami as a free agent. Uh, Horford jumps to Philly as a free agent. Durant jumps to Brooklyn as a free agent. Kyrie jumps to Brooklyn as a free agent. Kemba jumps from Charlotte to Boston as a free agent. So a lot of turnover last year. And then uh, 2020, James Harden. So what changed? What is the difference with these with the last four years compared to everything else? I think it's two things. I think first, the contracts are shorter, which the owners really push for because of that that time I, I mentioned from like 1999 through 2005, when you're signing these guys to six years, seven years, and it's just working out terribly for everybody. Half the time you're getting stuck with like this Vin Baker type contract. You're like, oh my God, this thing's got four years left. So they did shorter contracts and they also acquiesced on all these options where it's like, it's a five-year deal, but the guy's got an option after four years or it's a three-year deal, but after two years, he can bounce. So the team is constantly walking on eggshells with their best players. So you have that piece. At the same time, you also have players who I think are this generation of guys is much smarter and much more active. Their agents are much better at mobilizing. And they're just, the GMs are smart enough to know, I'm going to keep my job if my best guy is happy. Look at Daryl in Houston. He's consulting with James Harden on everything. LeBron, wherever he went, they're always, you know, they, the superstars get treated differently. You're treating somebody differently. After a while, they think they can just start calling the shots. And then if things go wrong, they don't feel any accountability at all. So you have that piece as well. And then the third piece is, I just think the spirit in the country has changed toward athletes and, you know, workers in general, where I think there's much more camaraderie with the fans and the players that happened before. So a piece of that is social media. The players, you have direct access to them. Um, I think in general, fans are rooting for players more than teams ever before. And the stuff like I grew up with, where if somebody just was doing what James Harden was doing right now, the the press would have been merciless. They would have been just destroying him, eviscerating him. He's an ingrate. Um, he's disloyal. These selfish superstars. That's the era of sports I grew up with, where we treated these players as adversaries if they wanted more money or they wanted a new opportunity. And now it's completely opposite. Now everyone's supportive of the players almost to a fault. It seems like the seesaw has swung too far the other way. And I, I think this James Harden thing is the culmination of that, where you have this guy who I think Houston did right for the last eight years in every respect, they tried to put the best possible teams around him. I'm not defending the new owner because he seems like a jackass. Anyone who can't figure out to keep Daryl, um, you know, and I know him, the, he, the classic new owner syndrome, all that stuff. Um, the Westbrook for Paul throwing in the two first picks, that was insane. That trade made no sense and they had no idea if it was going to work. It was, it was basically Hail Mary. So I'm not defending Houston, but it's weird to me that the players feel no obligation at all to the to the people that cheered them and supported them. It just doesn't matter to them anymore because they know there's not going to be a backlash. There's no fear at all to basically saying, I'm going to screw over this entire city. You know, even you think about Chris Webber, when he left Golden State in 94, when he forced his way out, every time he came back 
for a Warriors game from that point on. They booed him the entire game. And I was lucky enough, I went to a Sacramento Warriors game in 99 where they booed Weber every time he touched the ball. It was five years after he left. Um, that was the era where fans acted like that. They, fans were a lot more combative, I think, with players. Um, same thing for Vince Carter. Got booed every time he went back to Toronto for the rest of his career there. Now there's been this weird backlash of like, oh, we got to embrace Vince Carter and all the great times we had in Toronto. And people just kind of gloss over the part that he kind of quit on Toronto that last year he was there. So it just seems like we are giving these guys more and more leeway to do whatever they want. And my fear with this stuff is just, if we're just if the NBA is just now Tinder and guys can jump every time they're unhappy with, about anything, I don't know where this leaves coaches and teams and just the infrastructure of how to build a successful team. I don't know what kind of lessons we're learning from it. I don't know what like a 13-year-old kid watching this is just like, cool. So the first time anything, anything gets rough. There's any sort of rough patch. I'll, I'll just bounce. I'll just go to another team. That, that That's my lesson from this. And the guy who saw this in 2014, I talked about this on the book of basketball podcast was Pat Riley. He saw this whole era happening. He gave that press conference about three days before LeBron jumped. And I think he had a feeling LeBron was going to jump. And he made this whole, he gave this whole 40 minutes 40 minute press conference in this awesome speech this is honestly one of the best things he ever did where he's just like, this is hard. You don't win every year. Only one team gets to win every year. You're going to have rough patches. We had them with the Lakers. And if you look back at Riley's teams in the eighties, magic demand and be traded in 1981. They almost traded Kareem in 1983. They almost traded James Worthy in 1986. They held on to that nucleus and that team. They kind of rode the waves of what it's like to compete as an athlete. You're not going to win every year. You're just not. And I think we're losing that now. And I, I think that's why so many people in my life who are worried about the NBA um, are worried about it for that reason, that we are losing the piece of sometimes you got to fight through it. Sometimes the season's not going to work out the way you want. Sometimes you're going to have a weird dynamic with a team. Instead of solving issues, trying to learn from them, you have guys who are just at the first sign of dissension, trouble, losing, um, any sort of bad anything. They're just like, I'm out. Send me to the next place. And the fact that it worked for Anthony Davis and he won the title and it worked for Jimmy Butler and he became this hero in Miami, I think is just going to accelerate all of this. You know, what, what happens... If Atlanta's not as good as everyone thinks they're going to be, and Trey Young looks at it and goes, "Oh man, I thought we'd be better. Might have to, might have to uh, look elsewhere." The thing is, there's only so many good teams. There's only so many desirable teams to go to. We have the two teams in LA. I guess we have the 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 Nets. You would say the Knicks, no Celtics, Warriors, Mavericks. Like there, it's less than ten desirable teams. And I think we're the the fear for me is we're going to turn into this league where everybody just wants to go to the same seven teams and the competitive balance is shot and we don't get to actually root for the arc of a team. You know, maybe what happened with the Warriors there with Durant, that six-year run they had is the last time we're going to see a team even stay together for six years, give or take, with three stars. I all this stuff is a concern to, I think, me and everyone else who loves the league. And I, I think the way this Harden thing has been received the last few days was really startling to me because, first of all, they should have been, they should have fined him the moment he wasn't there. Um, the fact that he has so much control over the situation when he's signed a contract with them to play for them for two more years. And if he got hurt tomorrow, they would have to pay him for the next two years. They wouldn't be like, cool, we're not paying you. The, the lack of, um, an obligation that guys feel when they sign these big deals with these teams. And then they just feel like, well, now I got my contract. I can do whatever I want anyway. It really worries me for the long-term future of the league. And I think it worries a lot of people. Um, where, where are we going? Is this just going to be a league where people root for players and not teams? And if that's the case, you almost have to reconsider everything we're seeing and watching. You know, it's 2K. That's what, that's what it is. It's my son making his own 2K character and basically saying, cool, here's my 2K character. I'm going to play in Dallas next year. Eh, I didn't really like how Dallas went. I'm going to go to Houston. And 
that's just what the NBA is going to be. So anyway, the Harden thing makes me nervous. The TLDR of that whole essay is uh, the way this has been received and kind of the gall of him to just be like, the Rockets fans have rooted me for eight years. I'm just going to take a shit on him. I think it sucks. <laughs> 